Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Saddleback webinar this week. My name is Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. As you are beginning to log on, please locate your control bar, which is at the bottom of your web browser window. There you will find three very important icons. We have the chat, the Q&A, and the live transcript. Uh, if you would like to take advantage of subtitles today, you'll need to click on live transcript and then select show subtitles. The chat is the, is the best part. It's the most fun of the icons on the control bar. That is how you are going to interact with us today. Uh, when you have a thought or you just want to share or maybe ask a question of all of your fellow uh, attendees, you can put questions in the Q&A, but you can also drop them in the chat too. Just please be sure to select panelists and attendees from the drop down menu before you hit send. That way everybody can see what it is you have to say. Otherwise, only a handful of us will see it and that's fine too, but trust me, it's more fun if everybody can see because that uh, will increase the interaction today. Uh, the chat area is also where we will be placing links to resources from our session, so be on the lookout for that. If you don't see it there, just let us know and we'll drop the link in there for you again. Now the Q&A area is um, the preferred place for you to put your questions, either for Saddleback or for our presenter today, Anna Mattis. So um, we will address questions at the end of the session today. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Here is a quick reminder of how you can connect with us on social media. Saddleback and Anna are very active on social media. We would love to connect with you. So if you're joining us, uh, go ahead, give us a shout out, let everybody know you're joining us for this conversation today. And if you're catching this on the recording, still go ahead to Twitter, let everybody know you watched us today and tell us what you learned. Uh, we're really excited to have Anna here. So um, let's bring her in and say hi quickly. And then I have a question for all of you. Hello, Anna, how are you today? Well, hello, Liz. Thank you so much for having me and for everybody for joining us today. Of course, you know, we have been waiting to get you on our webinar for a long time. So the day has finally arrived um, and thank you for being here. I will officially introduce Anna to everybody in just a moment. But let me see, we have about 60 people on with us right now. The more will be joining us as we, as we proceed, I'm sure. So I have a question for all of you in the chat. Can you please go and let us know, this is great information for Anna. What are you teaching? Are you an ESL teacher? Are you a LOAT teacher or a foreign language teacher? If so, what languages do you teach? Please be sure to select panelists and attendees from the little to field before you hit send on that. And let us know, what are you teaching? It's going to be great to know who's here. That will really help you. I just did a little formative assessment, Liz. I, I took one of the answers from the chat and added it to my slide real fast. All right. So excellent. Really Perfect. Okay. Look at this. Oh, load and ES, oh, look, a load and ESL instructional coach. Interesting. People. Lots of ESL teachers. Wonderful. Bilingual coordinator. From Belton, I was in Belton last in February of 2019, I want to say. Belton's not too far from me. That's right, Central yeah. Texas. There we go, bilingual. Oh, from Madrid. Hi, Ana Maria. Welcome, everybody. Good. Okay. Oh, that sounds exciting, bilingual bicultural teaching certification. That's very interesting, Vivian. Wow. Hi, Maria. Good to see you. Okay, so I think, I think we have a lot of ESL teachers joining us today with a, it looks like we have a, 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 a sprinkling of uh, foreign language teachers in there, but um, okay. Thanks, Maria. Maria's an ESL teacher too. Okay, thank, keep it coming, keep it coming. We, we're gonna move along, but keep letting us know in the chat where you are from and what you teach. Uh, that is good information for us to know as we uh, continue with sharing our information today. Well, All right, so- We're getting a lot of people responding to panelists. So maybe quick, quick reminder to- Oh, thank you. And attendees, yes. I get to see where you wonderful people are from. Yes, please select panelists and attendees before you hit send. That way everybody can see, um, yeah. So don't forget to do that. There you go. Thanks, Patty. All right. Awesome. Yeah, it's tricky. I don't know why it does that, but panelists and attendees is the way to go. It's one little click before you type your comment and hit send. Awesome. All right. Well, let's officially start. So our conversation today is about enhancing ESL instruction with strategies from the foreign language classroom. We know that um, for some strange reason, ESL and foreign language teachers sort of are, are siloed from each other um, and 
I don't know why, but there's a lot of overlap there and uh, we can definitely learn from each other. So joining us to discuss this very important topic today is Anna Mattis and she is a writer and consultant for Sideless Education. I'm sure many of you know that already, uh, but for those of you who don't, here's a little bit of background information for Anna. Her love of language and her love of language learning stems from childhood experiences as an immigrant and ESL student from Budapest, Hungary. She's proficient in multiple languages and, in pas and she's passionate about second language acquisition for all ages, sheltered instruction strategies, heritage language learning, and long-term ELL research. She's a former high school French teacher and has led professional development at the state and national level, coached teachers in language learning strategies, and created instructional products for both teachers and administrators working with ESL students. So a lot of expertise here. Anna is the author of Seven Steps to a Language-Rich Interactive Foreign Language Classroom, and she is co-author of a book that many of you already know about, Boosting Achievement, Reaching Students with Interrupted or Minimal Education with Carol Salva, another friend to the webinar series. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm so looking forward to this, and um, everybody keep your uh, fingers ready for uh, some engagement with the, the chat today. So. I'm going to, I'll let you take it from here. I'll go ahead and turn off my camera and microphone and you can start your slide share. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Give me one second, beautiful people. Here we go. All right. Thank you again, Liz, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to all of the educators that are joining me today. I just want to take a quick step back and say what you all have done in this past year is absolutely phenomenal and worthy of so much praise for being able to shift and make language acquisition happen online. It's such a wonderful thing. And for so many of us that signed up for this today, the hundreds of you that signed up for this today, I really, really hope that I'm able to share something that's worthwhile and worthy of your time because I know how busy we all are. So thank you again for being here. Um, as Liz mentioned, I am author and co-author of the two books that you see on the screen, Boosting Achievement for um, SLIFE, it's an acronym we'll talk about, Students with Limited and Interruptible Formal Education, as well as the Seven Steps to a Language-Rich Foreign Language Classroom. So I'll be pulling a little bit from both of those. At the heart of the matter though, is my goal and my ultimate mission in life, which is to get ESL and LOAT teachers to collaborate because there's such a wealth of information sharing that can be happening between the two of them. But to back up, let's talk a little bit about acronyms, something I'm calling terminology soup because even in the chat, I could see that we have acronyms joining us from all over the board. So ESL, ESOL, we have our English language learners, our English learners, ELD, ENL and ENL and EFL. Slightly different, but the goal here is teaching English to our students. Now, LOAT is familiar to some, not familiar to others. It stands for languages other than English, but oftentimes we see world language as well as our foreign language teachers in this category. So education, full of acronyms, but at the end of the day, our goal today is language acquisition for our learners, which is why I have this beautiful Lotus Peace Sign Bitmoji of MLL. That is who we are serving. All of us are serving our multilingual learners, okay? A little bit about my background, because that speaks into why I get to, to double dip in both worlds. So as Liz mentioned, I am Hungarian. Hungarian was my first language. I moved to the States when I was about five years old, and I didn't speak English, a word of English, until I got to school. Um, in the late 80s in Kansas City, there wasn't really a structured ESL program, so my English knowledge came from Sesame Street and the Oxford English Language Picture Dictionary. Those were my, my survival tools that I had at my tool belt. Um, we moved to a small town north of Houston called Kingwood, Texas. And in Kingwood, that's where I began my love of French. I started French in the seventh or eighth grade. I took it all throughout middle school and high school. It was my minor in university. And my first teaching job was actually to begin a French program at a ninth grade campus in the northern part of Houston that had never had French before. And so what I did, of course, was set up my classroom just like my classroom was set up for me in the 90s. I taught with the exact same methodology because at that point I hadn't really had a lot of pedagogical knowledge or background. I taught the way that I was taught and 
it did not work out well for me because what I wasn't taking into account was the linguistic background of my students. The majority of my students, 98% in fact, were Spanish speaking. And for me, I went back as an adult to learn Spanish so I could start understanding what some of those errors were that were happening in my classroom and how I could start bridging linguistic connections between my Spanish speakers and giving them the tools to empower them and make them trilingual. So that was, that was my ultimate goal. But here's what I found out just in that high school experience. I found out, and Liz mentioned the word silos, and I'll come back to that in a second, that when it came time for my professional development, what was I gonna do to move my craft as a teacher? I was not a part of anything that was really and truly worthwhile. On our campus, and let me know if this is your experience as well, our departmental professional development days were broken up like this. You had the English department, right? And that included your English, ESL, your reading specialists, your paraprofessionals, anybody whose matter was, subject matter was English in some capacity, got to meet together and talk about interventions and language accommodations and vocabulary development but not the foreign language teachers. This was our lovely category. We were the elective teachers, which was great and a lot of fun, which meant also that my professional development happened with the health teacher, the baseball coach, the dance teacher, the art teacher, phenomenal people. But what our PD looked like couldn't be 180 degrees more different. We were talking discipline and coloring in quadrants and doing rigor and relevance. All of those things which are important, but it wasn't the, the knowledge that we, I could have gotten if our ESL teachers were allowed to, to collaborate together with our foreign language teachers. And as I moved on from teaching into instructional coaching and bilingual ESL specialist type of positions, I noticed that these silos were apparent, not just on my campus, but in districts all over the place. So if you're from Texas or outside, you might think of this when I say the word silos, right? Magnolia Market, if you're from Central Texas near Liz, you might be familiar with Chip and Joanna Gaines. That is not the kind of silos that I'm talking about. And I hope somebody out there, maybe if you're watching on the replay, you think this is funny. So give me a laugh if you're laughing along. The kind of silos we're talking about, why not quite grain silos? If you put in the definition though, what are silos in education? It's compartmentalized learning. It's compartmentalization where you have entities that are just not interacting. And that's what I have found in my work in this field over the last 10 years, that our English language teachers and our low teachers are not collaborating as much as they could. At the end of the day, our goal is the same. The ultimate goal is language acquisition. So what do we do to, to further these opportunities? And I'm gonna be talking about that in a little bit more detail. So I have a question for you to type into the chat. Um, we're very big on sentence stems here. So if you have the ability to use STEM, one linguistic challenge that ESL and LOAT students face is. Now, I had to add in that word linguistic because I know there's a lot of other factors going on, but let's take a second and see what your responses are. What are some linguistic challenges that you're finding that your ESL and or foreign language students are facing? Okay, that's lack of authentic speaking opportunities. That's wonderful, Megan. I'm gonna be speaking exactly to that. Lack of vocabulary, perfect. We have harder to imitate the new sounds. That's so true. We're gonna to speak to the pronunciation. Lack of oral proficiency, absolutely. The chance to speak. I'm reading some of these out loud for those of us that are on replay and not being able to read in the chat. Um, lack of opportunities to practice in a low stress. Tina Bean, that's a phenomenal answer. It's like I planted you in my audience. Practice and immersion. Okay, good. Limited opportunities to practice. So good. Absolutely. Lack of vocabulary and opportunities to practice. So it's coming up over and over again. And, and the beauty of that it means that the educators that are here with us today understand how important it is that students not just get the information, but they have the ability to do something with it. So when I ask this question, the top responses that I tend to get are number one, 
difficulty understanding the target or the L2. That's another little acronym that I'm going to be using. If the word target language is new to you, that's very much a low term. We're talking about the language that the students in the classroom are trying to learn. So if you're an ESL teacher, it's English. If you're French, Russian, German, Mandarin, what have you, that's the L2. Our target language is the language of the classroom. Our students have difficulty expressing themselves. They know what they want to say, they just don't know how to say it, whether that's in speaking or in writing. Low confidence and low motivation is huge in our foreign language and our ESL classes. And then finally, what several of you said, pronunciation. You might know exactly what you want to say, but if you don't know how to say it and how that's going to sound, that's going to what raise the effective filter and not give you the, the confidence to speak. And we want to be talking about strategies that can help lower that effective filter. So hopefully we'll, we'll get there. Now, there is somebody in the audience that I saw was an ENL coach, and I loved that, an ENL coach. Some school districts across the country are really catching on to this concept of the collaboration between the two. And I recently met a wonderful woman, her name's Betsy Strong from Birdville ISD, and she's the language acquisition coach. And that's exactly what her position is. She's over both bilingual ESL and world language, observing those teachers, doing professional development for those teachers to see just how those two can op, um, collaborate in a rich way. And one of the questions that she threw at me that she gets a lot was that ESL teachers are typically trained on sheltered instruction and couldn't our world language teachers benefit from that same opportunity? And the answer of course is yes. But, but let's take a step back. So if you're coming from a foreign language perspective, this term might be new to you, sheltered instruction. The, the most simplistic way to describe that is you're teaching with la the language through the content and using second language acquisition methods. What we used to explain that is you're simply teaching content as if it were a foreign language. Now, the funny thing about this is when I do my training for teachers, especially for content area teachers that have ESL students in their classroom, and I ask them, how many of you took a foreign language? Okay, now if you remember, what were some of those things that your foreign language teacher did to make the content comprehensible? And what did you get? Visuals, gestures, realia, they had us dialogue, they used stories, articles, movies, songs, videos. They described a truly language-rich and interactive classroom to make that content comprehensible to them. And, and those are the things that we try and get our teachers to emulate when it's a content area and they have ESL learners. Those ESL learners are learning the language. They need just as much rich structure and support to help them produce. So when this was my aha moment in education, which just really transformed my trajectory, came after I finished my master's degree. There's my Longhorn for University of Texas at Austin. I did my studies in foreign language education, really focusing on second language acquisition. But the, the ball didn't drop until I received this training. So in the middle of the slide, you see the original seven steps to a language rich interactive classroom. John Seidlitz was the author, and he wrote this book and has created this training with ESL students in mind in these content area classrooms. And my world was shifted when I received this training. And by the time we left for our lunch break, he had 120 content area teachers speaking and writing in German. And they had never spoken German before. They'd never written German before, much less had any kind of opportunity to practice the listening, speaking, reading, writing. And here we were. And I wanted to dig into these steps and see how could I bring these to our foreign language teachers who could benefit so much from this type of sheltered instruction training. And so that's how, how this book was born, the, the Seven Steps to Load, which is really, really backed up with second language acquisition methods research, particular to our foreign language teachers. Some of the things that they, they share, and these are aspects that we're going to talk about, is the idea surrounding the motivation of language learners, because you want to know their why. You want to know the why of the students so you can meet them better. Um, they both share the idea of comprehensible input and low stress opportunities for output that all of our language learners need so much, and then sharing research-based strategies to really help facilitate that language acquisition, because 
like I said at the first slide, the heart of the matter is that our teachers in all of these departments understand language acquisition. And if they truly understand that, then they're going to be able to facilitate better pedagogical choices to help our students with their language development as well. So let's start with some of those factors. Some of the factors affecting, and I'm gonna say SLA. So if you need another acronym to add to your list, SLA, Second Language Acquisition. We know that motivation plays into it. Our students age when they begin learning the second language, of course, plays into it. When I say access to language, I mean the access that teachers provide to their students. So is it sentence stems, is it visuals, is it opportunities to interact? That's what I mean by access. Personality for sure plays into it the first language development, our cognitive ability, and the teacher's quality of instruction. All of these to some extent affect the second language development in our students. But well, my question to you, and we're gonna go back to the chat, is what are three of the most critical factors that affect second language acquisition that we can control? Because some of these, we don't have control over, right? So you're using the stem that I left for you here. The most critical factors that teachers can control are. And think about that. I have my chat open. So let's take a look. We obviously know some of these are not controllable. We can't control a student's age, can we? We can't really control personality. We can control behavior. We can't control personality. So what do you think are some of those factors that we can control. Okay, motivation, access to language, you have quality of instruction, the classroom climate, absolutely. It's not on the list, but we can, and those three play into it, good. Making students feel welcome, sure, sure, the quality of our instruction. So to me, make community and having that classroom culture plays into the motivation because we as teachers can create that motivating environment for our language learners, right? Absolutely, access to language, access to language by creating a safe space. Yes, that's so important, absolutely, that safe space. Motivation, okay, so it seems like we are, we're hitting it, very, very good. The three that I chose to be the most critical are the motivation, the access to language, and of course, our quality of instruction. So we're going to dive in, especially into the first two, a little bit more significantly. When I talk about motivation, I'm going to be coming at it from the foreign language perspective. But if you're coming from an ESL lens, start thinking about how this does or does not apply to your context. There's varying types of motivation that we can talk about, intrinsic or integrative. If it's intrinsic, we know that our students are getting some kind of an internal fulfillment from learning the language. They're enthusiastic about learning our language and culture. That's what they do when they sign up to, for your foreign languages. Or integrative, they want to travel abroad. They have that innate desire to assimilate. And here, when I mean assimilate, I'm just um, specifically talking about the pronunciation, that they're going to have the skills to sound somewhat native-like so they don't get cherry-picked if they're traveling abroad. We have extrinsic or the instrumental, which are more of our external rewards, right? We want to take a language or learn a foreign language because it looks good on our resume. It's a skill that we want to have, whether it's to get into a good college, whether it's doing it as an adult for our uh, resumes for our career. It's skill building. As a high school student, you need that credit to graduate. So you're going to sign up for the foreign language classroom. Now, the funny one that I'll share, which let me know in the chat if you've experienced this, is a schedule change. I had a lot of schedule change students. Miss, I really wanted to be in football, but it was only available in this period. So I had to be in your class. Here I am. Teach me French. That's not fun for anyone, but it's a good challenge, it's a good challenge, and hopefully if you're providing some really good strategies, you're gonna help that student too in lowering their affective filter and wanting to, uh, wanting to communicate. So how does that change though when it's ESL, when it's our ESL learners? Some of these, depending on the proficiency of your students and the situation that brought them to your classroom could apply, but a lot of this, it's really, it's survival, right? For me, absolutely, it was survival. I didn't speak the language of my co-students in kindergarten. I needed the ESL, I needed the support. 
but, but it's not the same for all of our students. So what is at the foundation? Where do we begin? Let's begin with foundational language acquisition. When we have comprehensible input, when we teach with comprehensible input and provide that practice that so many of you stated in the chat, those low stress opportunities for output, that's the vehicle for fueling language acquisition and language development. Now let's get a little funny. We're gonna do some SLA 101, so Second Language Acquisition 101, okay? Comprehensible input. Who do we think of, class, when we think of comprehensible input? I know, Stephen Krashen. There he is. I got to meet the man himself about four years ago when he was keynoting at the at TESOL in Texas, the Texas State TESOL. I am a couple inches taller than him. He's not very tall, but regardless, he came up with the core ideas that we talk about today when we speak about comprehensible input. And the gist of it is what you see there on the slide. It's language that you can understand the essence of, whether that comes through visuals, gestures, the realia, slowing you down your rates of speech to make it more understandable. A strong combination of all of those can help provide our language learners with comprehensible input. Krashen also says that learners really internalize that language when the comprehensible input that you provide is interesting and also slightly above the current level of proficiency. So that's that I plus one. How many of you have not thought about I plus one since you took your language certification tests? There it is for you again, the I plus one. It's really important. And we're gonna to get to why that is when we speak about output. In the last 10 years or so, Krashen has really been focusing a lot of his attention and publishing about this concept of compelling input. This is something that Carol Salva and I wrote about in Boosting Achievement. She found that when she brought in content that even if it was not very much in tune with where her students were in proficiency, but it was interesting, they wanted more and more of it. And so what Krashen says in his idea is that students can actually acquire the language because they forget it's in another language. He says that if it's compelling, the input appears to eliminate the need for motivation, which he calls a conscious desire to improve, because when you get compelling input, you're acquiring it um, based on your interest which I think is just a phenomenal way for us to think about what is the input that we are providing to our learners, whether they're English language learners or whether they are foreign language learners, we want that input to be interesting. That's one of those reasons that I'm such a huge fan of Saddleback provides these high low, the high interest, low level readers that are on target with where our students are at just developmentally and from a social emotional perspective, what is it that they want to be reading about well, let's get it to them at a level that's attainable for them. That's good comprehensible input. Let's take a look at some, some other sources. So you have Anna here in the right corner. We're gonna be talking about the LOAT comprehensible input sources. Visuals, visuals are so key in our classroom. And, and for me, I'm a big fan of photography. I know a lot of teachers that rely on photography as well for providing input. Photography is truth. Photography is news. Photography is history. Photography, you capture things that are happening in those target languages, in those target cultures, and bring them to life to our students. So they're so incredibly powerful to bring into our, our classrooms. From an auditory standpoint, when we're thinking about the, either the audio or the visual, news in slow French, news in slow Spanish, there's a, a lot of different languages that you can get this in. It's interesting, compelling input, but it's been slightly, students can slow it down to meet them where they're at. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the YouTube feature. It's really great. If you have certain videos, you're allowed to not only select the subtitles that you want, what language you want those subtitles in, but again, you can slow down the speed at which you're getting the information, which makes it a phenomenal tool for language learning in the classroom. Podcasts are, of course, just a plethora of them are available in multiple languages that students can listen to on their own time. And then we have articles and stories. And the important thing that I want to, to point out here is, look at the examples I have, Le Monde, Die Welt, and El Mundo. We're going straight to the sources themselves. We're using authentic resources coming from the language that then you as a teacher in your craft 
can make an embedded reading out of, can, can take the information and break it down to vocabulary and grammatical concepts that are applicable to where your students are at. So it's work on the part of the teachers, but we're pulling from authentic resources, which we want to see. Those are one of our standards in the low classroom that's so very important to us. How does this shift when we're talking about ESL? If you take a look at it, it's not that much different. For our content area teachers with ESL students, they need a plethora of visuals. Carol Salva in, in Boosting Achievement says, your walls should be your co-teacher. And I love that phrase because again, it's applicable to both camps. You can see, especially if the examples are student created, that's really powerful for our students to use that as their information. Um, there's news and slow English, similar to how I just showed on the previous slide, the news and slow French and Spanish podcasts and news and levels in Newzella are phenomenal sources of getting that compelling input, but that you as the teacher are able to pick the differentiated proficiency level that's going to best meet your students to get them to that, that I plus one level. I want to make a, a quick shout out here before I forget, you see the QR code in my top left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, Michelle Shorey and Irina McGrath, who are phenomenal educators that did a podcast, I'm sorry, did this webinar just a couple of weeks ago, I think. They did a session called Tequity for MLLs. And that webinar is filled with such amazing tools that you can use for both, actually, even though it was targeted more towards your English language learners. We're, we're a family now, multilingual learners, and I really encourage you to, to scan that code and check out the tools that they have for our current context that you can use with your students. So let me bring up a question that I get a lot. Is the native language use allowed? I get this both from teachers, whether it's content area teacher with ESL students, whether it's an ESL teacher or the foreign language teacher wanting to know how much of the, the native language, the primary language, am I allowed to use with my students? So I'm gonna attack this question from the perspective first of LOAT. ACTFL is the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. As a foreign language teacher, you know that this is our governing body. ACTFL creates our standards that we use to teach and then districts across the states use their version, their, use these ACTFL standards and create their own version, whether they call them LOAT standards, world language standards, foreign language standards, they stem from ACTFL and its communicative competencies that they want us as world language teachers to be using to, to guide our instruction. And one of ACTFL's guiding principles, and they, they publish this on their site, you can read much more about it, is this idea of the 90-10. And what that means is, as a world language teacher, you are encouraged that to do 90% of your instruction in the target language for your students. And it says there, learners need as much exposure as possible to the target language for the acquisition to occur. So that's the reasoning behind it. And, and to me, that's, understandable. It also speaks to the fact a little bit, this is slightly controversial, but it, but I get a lot of agreement on this. It's not always best practice as a world language teacher to teach from the first day 100% in the target language and just hope that your students rise to the occasion and catch up if you're not doing checks for comprehension and providing comprehensible input. But think about that when we're talking about the 90. But let's shift for a second and talk about that 10. That 10 is really important. Uh, I learned more about this concept when I attended an actual, a regional actual conference a couple of years ago. It was put on this particular session by the past president of actual, and he did a session just on this. And I asked him, tell me more about the 10. I get your 90, but I wanna know about the 10. And he said that in a foreign language context, if English is the predominant language of the learners in the classroom, that you can use English, the use of English is appropriate when you're providing specific types of comprehensible input that otherwise you can tell your students are not understanding. It's important when you're explaining the context the context surrounding a certain cultural aspect or a certain grammatical concept, and in interactions. The nature of interactions sometimes just have to be explained. You know, when I had my Spanish-speaking French learners, the, the idea of using the tu and the vu form was just 
a completely foreign concept to them, even though some of them were doing it in Spanish, but I think they weren't doing it uh, consciously. So that's something that there's no way I could use in French one, I could have explained that to them in French. I needed to back up, I needed to provide that in a language that was understandable to them to get those aha, okay, got it moments, and then we move on. You are allowed to do that, absolutely, to get your students to be where you're at and then move on, okay? This is key. If the teacher teaches with that 90%, the target language must be understood or it's not really the 90%. How do you get to the 90? How do you know if you're doing the 90? It's comprehensible input. Are you providing opportunities for your students to negotiate meaning with each other? Are you doing formative assessment checks to make sure that your students are there with you? If you're not doing that, how do you know that your students really are comprehending? You might not actually be in the 90. And Crash intends to agree with this. So back to our SLA 101, both from the ESL and from the foreign language concept, if the input, or sorry, input must be comprehensible to have an effect on language acquisition and literacy development. We want to make sure that that input is comprehensible. So what do we do? What are the implications of that? for our content area teachers that have ESL students in the classroom, especially when they don't speak the language of that student, could the theory apply? So what did I do here? I crossed out the target, the word target, and I input English. The teacher teaches 90%, the English must be understood. Does that work? It really does, because the students are going to need that content information in the target language, but they might need some more help along the way. So where does that help come from? It comes from the 10%. It comes from us as teachers allowing students, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here when it comes to our load and ESL teachers, I think they get this. I think they understand that meaning making sometimes has to happen in the original home language of the students. But the pushback that we receive, and a lot of you that are ENL coaches and ESL coaches, I bet you're getting this from your content area teachers, that teachers question, well, they're supposed to learn English. Why, why do I have to let them use their, their native language? Because they need to make sure that the input they're receiving is comprehensible to them. So how do we do that? We allow interactions with native language speaking buddies or peers, if you're lucky enough to have them in the classroom, let them negotiate for meaning among each other in the native language. It's letting them use bilingual dictionaries if you have those available. It's online translators if you allow your students to do that. And simply comprehension checks that are happening along the way, whether it's in the form of total response signals, whether you're having students respond to sentence stems, exit tickets, red cards, green cards, some kind of formative assessment so you know and you have the measurable proof that your students are understanding. That's how we get to, to this kind of comprehension model. Now, Pamela Broussard, which some of you are familiar with, she's at Leading ELLs, um, she's a newcomer teacher in Houston, Texas. And she has a phenomenal presence on Twitter and on Facebook. She shared this tool with me recently. It's mylanguages.org. And what it does is it provides grammar and vocabulary in the first language of hundreds of languages, especially rare ones that a lot of us that are teaching those SLIFE students, students with limited or interrupted formal education, if you don't have the ability to speak in that native language, which the majority of us don't, there's a place where you could go that you could receive information in the target language of the student to preload your instruction with that, allow your student to explore this so that they can start making those connections. She says, Pam says that she does that in her instruction, particularly when it comes to a grammar or a vocabulary lesson. She'll actually take a look at the student's native language to see how something is laid out, how it's written, how it's spelled, so she can better her instruction and her pedagogical practice by helping the student make those connections. So don't be afraid to, to do what's in your power to serve our students best. Okay, take a breath. That was comprehensible input. It's a lot, and I know that comprehensible input is familiar to a lot of you, but it never, never helps to go back and revisit this. So let's talk about output. Now, 
output doesn't get as much as much jazz as the input piece. And I'm sure many of you take a look at this lovely woman on my slide and you have no idea who she is. I'll tell you, this is Meryl Swain. She's a Canadian linguist and she did seminal research on the output hypothesis. And I'll tell you a little bit about where that, that research stems from. But what's really important to take in, into consideration here when we're talking about output, it's not forced. We honor student silent period and it takes into account the affective filter. I didn't make an SLA 101 slide about the affective filter because I'm making the educational guess that the hundreds of you that are on here know what an affective filter is, but, but we want to be conscious of that when we're talking about language learning at all levels. So, oh, that's so cool. I'm reading the chat. I'm sorry. I have to say that she was your PhD thesis supervisor. That's the coolest thing. Yay, Meryl Swain. Okay. The gist of Meryl Swain's output hypothesis is this. A language learner attempts to speak in the target language. And if they haven't received the copious amounts of input and opportunities to practice, naturally what's gonna happen, they make errors. Now, in that interaction, if the teacher or the peer is, has language that's at that I plus one level, whether they're native-like or just even slightly more proficient, ideally that learner is gonna notice that there is a gap between his or her level of proficiency and the one of the person they're interacting with. So they're gonna be more attuned to listen and in turn fine tune the language that they're going to produce. So when the learner goes to attempt to say the utterance again, that input has been modified because of the input that was received. So you see it's really the input and the output working symbiotically, but the output is, is really important. Um, Meryl Swain did her foundational research, like I said, in Canada, and she used the, the French immersion schools as a model. What she did was she took a classroom of K-6. We had your English L1 students learning the French, as well as your native speaking French students learning together. And what her research found was that despite the fact that those L1 students were receiving copious amounts of comprehensible input, and of course, why wouldn't they, given their context and what's around them, not just within the classroom walls, but outside in their community, they were receiving copious amounts of input, but they lacked the opportunity to practice. Their speech was lacking the opportunity to make extended utterances in the L2. And that's why the language wasn't developing despite the comprehensible input that was present. So we really take that into account when we're talking about language acquisition, that yes, TPRS, super important and it's phenomenal. But like so many of you mentioned, the students need the opportunity to practice. They need that opportunity, even if it's to fail, because what does the hypothesis show us? It's beautiful to fail. I'll go back again. It's a wonderful thing to fail because where are we on the floor? We're just gonna go higher if we fail. Failing is a wonderful thing because it's gonna help us fine tune our language and ultimately produce more. That's the goal. So let's talk about output, how we get there. One of the questions that I received a lot as a new teacher, especially, I got this from my students, miss, Teach me something to say in French. Now, this was coming not only from the students within my classroom, but as I mentioned, I started a French program on a campus that had never had French before in a predominantly Spanish speaking community. So I was a wild, crazy being here with this language. I would have students knocking at my door in the passing period, yelling this to me down the hallway. This, teach me something to say in French. And what did I do? I don't know, I, I, I gave them little tiny pieces of vocabulary, nothing that was of, of any kind of interest or importance. This is what I wish I would have done if I had the training though. Step one of the, the seven steps, I mentioned the seven steps earlier, which works wonderfully both for a LOAT or an ESL context, is to teach students what to say when they don't know what to say, okay? We're teaching our students to ask for clarification. So here's what it might look like. I pulled some of the clarification stems that come from our load training. And you can see, may I have some time to think? Can I have more information? Would you repeat the question? How do I say this? 
How do I pronounce this in the target language? Don't you think that as a learner, you would ultimately want to have a solid grasp of what these statements are so you can get your needs met, which is ask, ask, asking for more information. So what I encourage my teachers to do, whether they're content area teachers with ESL students, ESL teachers, or the foreign language teachers, is begin here on day one. Teach your students these STEMs in the target language, and ultimately you'll be on your way to that goal. It includes the pronunciation, which again, if I go back to the chat, several of you mentioned that that's one of those things students face. Why not begin the first pronunciation lesson in your class with teaching students how to pronounce these critical clarification stems that they're going to need, not just for survival in your language class, but then moving on. So teach your students what to say when they don't know what to say. I'm gonna pull some examples here from, from wonderful friends of ours in Southwest ISD. This is a school district in San Antonio, Texas. Teachers in their bilingual and ESL department created these, you can tell these are virtual backgrounds for Zoom so that when their teachers are teaching, whether foreign language, bilingual, ESL, their students have these phrases at their fingertips. The beauty of it, which is something that I tell all of my teachers is, make this part of your classroom culture. It's not just a, a check the box thing to do, really implement it as part of the classroom culture so that it's not just your lower level novice students that might need this kind of clarification. It's okay for anybody to use. Our advanced students can always ask a friend for help and sound very intelligent while they're doing it and stick in the target language. Here's example, um, another example again, this is from Southwest ISD. This is in, in Spanish. I love these, I absolutely love these ideas. So I wanna give them some credit. Why do we do that? Now I've been, I've mentioned Actful already. Actful has, and you can search for these, they're high yield strategies for students. And if you take a look at the list, what I did when I came out with the book was I made a crossover. How do the seven steps to a language rich interactive foreign language classroom collaborate, how do they correspond to Actful's high yield strategies? And if you take a look, don't worry, you'll be getting these in your slides. So if you can't read the teeny tiny print, don't worry about it, you'll get a copy of it. Negotiate meaning with students, encouraging negotiation among students, and conducting comprehension checks are something that they encourage as high yield practice. But the number one thing that I loved seeing here was teach students strategies for requesting clarification when faced with comprehension difficulties. We want our students, whether they're in our foreign language class, whether they're in our English language class, to be able to, to have the help when they need it. It also speaks back to the number one thing that came up, remember when I asked you for your challenges, it's difficulty understanding the target language. This is just a vehicle that pronounced give students that access to language so they know what to say when they don't know what to say. If we go back to those two factors that are in our control, the motivation and the access to language, we can see that when students have this strategy in their tool belt, it can help lower the affective filter. It creates almost a game-like atmosphere. I love it because it's that mutual support in a classroom environment. Again, it's not just your low level, it's available to any of your language learners and encourages output. No matter what, from day one, your students are speaking in that target language and they're able to get their needs met. It's an entry point for beginners. That's why the access is there. It provides opportunities for negotiated input. That's what Meryl Swain was saying is so critical. And it helps students to stay in that target language when they're stuck, okay? What else? Sentence stems. I know hopefully everybody that's watching this both live and in the replay, you're familiar with sentence stems, you know where they're at, but they're so important, again, to help our students stay motivated because they know what's coming and what they have to answer when they have sentence stems, and you're providing that access point for them to do so. It gives students the opportunity to practice new vocabulary. That's something that I did almost every day in my foreign language classroom was 
I would take vocabulary that we learned in the previous lesson from the day before, and I would embed it into a STEM. And it was part of their warm up for my students every day in their interactive notebooks that they had to write a sentence in French that utilized the new vocabulary. They didn't have to use my STEM. That's the beauty of it. It's, it's able to be differentiated, but it was there for them if they needed that information. It helps facilitate conversation using the target language that's very apparent in our foreign language classrooms where we do so much dialoguing back and forth, right? It gives students the opportunity to respond in the form of a complete sentence, which is a very, very strong thing for them to do um, because it helps with both oral language and in their writing. And one of the things that we say is students cannot write in a way that they cannot speak. So we want to really, really encourage both the, the oral and the written language when we're talking about the target language. If you're teaching hybrid or you're virtual, here's some tools for you. Hopefully, I know that Flipgrid is not new to anybody, but if it is, welcome to Flipgrid. It's a phenomenal free program. You can do it online. You can get the app for it. A uh, lot of the world language teachers that I work with use it for assessing speaking proficiency. It's low stress for your learners. If you have learners that don't want their faces on camera, they can put their finger above the camera like I just did now. They can use a picture. I've had teachers even use pets instead, bitmojis or whatnot. But it's a great way for students to get to listen to their own speaking abilities and then teachers and students can interact with each other. The other one that I want to mention, a new one that I'm really liking right now is Voice In. It's an extension for Google Chrome, free. You can download it and then select your target language. And I tried it out in French and in Hungarian. And what it does is you click the little microphone button, you speak in the language and Voice In listens and then records what it thinks you said just doo -doo -doo -doo, right there in front of you. I think it's a really great motivator for our, both for foreign language and for ESL because it really hones in on the importance of pronunciation, right? You want your pronunciation to be on par so that the Voice In app can can pick up exactly what you're trying to say. So give that a try if you haven't already. Um, Patricia Flores, I don't know if she's out here or not. She's a wonderful, wonderful educator who's taken a lot of the ideas of seven steps load and, and brought them to life in her classroom. And here's a tweet that she did with this one activity called Pass Along Papers. This is an activity that I created based on my experience with my own students about 10 years ago, because I found that a lot of my learners, both French 1 and French 2, had a lot of hesitancy when it came to their writing. Um, they were, they were nervous about the blank sheet of paper and then producing the target language and writing. So what I did was I changed the classroom environment around. I actually did, when we were obviously 10 years ago in person, I put my desks into circles, but you could, you could do rows, you could do squares, whatever you want. I chose circles. And every student had a sheet of paper that had a stem that I created based on the content and the vocabulary. And gave them two minutes and they had to respond using that stem. After the two minutes were up, you shift that paper, you pass it along to the person on your right, and then you get to see an example from one of your classmates. What I love about it is if you take a look at that third bullet, it boosts confidence of your hesitant writers by allowing them to see peer examples. This is both from a positive context and a negative context. If you don't know what to say, great, I can see somebody that might be slightly more proficient than me and I can copy their response but maybe change the vocabulary. I'm okay with that because you're practicing writing in the target language. But what if you get a negative response? What if the person next to you wasn't able to answer it or they answered it incorrectly just like you answered yours incorrectly? That's still a motivator because you're showing that other students in the class are in the same boat as you. If you're feeling a little hesitant, maybe your partner is as well. We're gonna catch up with that once we get a chance to see everybody's writing in your little cohort. And then we put the writing up on the screen and take a look and sell, circle questions that students had, circle missed opportunities, celebrate things that they got right. It turned into a really interactive opportunity um, that I loved repeating year after year with my students. To take a little bit from Boosting Achievement with Carol Sable, we put this image into our book, that if you're the content area teacher, you use the language, those co comprehensible input strategies to make the concepts salient to your students. If you're an ESL teacher, 
you're kind of doing the reverse. You take the content concepts that your students need to learn, and those are your vehicle for teaching the language. The same rings true for our LOAT teachers. When you provide compelling input about the content, about the culture, that becomes the fuel for your students to, to learn the language. Uh, Carol and I in the book had had this, this top five list for ESL teachers and top five list for content area teachers. And what I did was I married those together. We're wrapping up here. I married those together and added LOAT teachers into the context. So your ESL and your LOAT teachers, you should have your students practice speaking the target language every day. That's a given. Encourage your students to ask for clarification using those I don't know stems. Have students verbalize every day for that practice. You want your students to corally read. So this is reading something out loud, whether it's your objective, whether it's sentence stems, whether it's vocabulary, every day to really give them that practice. You want your students reading compelling, interesting, meaningful content to them in a way that's appropriately scaffolded for their level and also referring, you as a teacher, you're referring to those visuals around the room because your walls should be a co-teacher. Your walls should be a co-teacher. And finally, we want to have our students writing at least one sentence in the target language every day, okay? Finally, my final takeaway is that if you're an ESL and a low teacher, I encourage you to collaborate to get together, to try and find professional development opportunities that you could attend together virtually or once we're back together in person because you have such a wealth of knowledge to share with each other. So our PLN, our professional learning networks, are phenomenal places to do that. If you're an ESL teacher, check out the hashtag LangChat. Phenomenal ideas are coming through every single day from world language educators across the country and the world that follow this hashtag that you could really, really see how you could adapt it to the ESL context. So that is the majority of what I have for you. If this is a conversation that you want to keep having, um, I recently launched my website, so 7stepsloat.com, where you can get more information about the book, the training, as well as other resources for world language teachers. And on there, I have a link to a podcast that I recorded with Steve Sophronis from, uh, from Elevation Education. We specifically go into this, the collaboration between EL and low teachers and what they have to learn from each other, because I think the opportunities are limitless. So thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to ask you to respond to this stem in the chat. Uh, one idea that this webinar gave me is, this is your exit ticket. And while I'll come back to that quickly, one idea that this webinar gave me is I did want to mention that I'm doing an online conference. It's two weeks from now, three weeks from now, on June 10th from 9 to 12 Central. And I'll be going into a lot of the seven steps for the foreign language classroom in a bit further detail. But um, it's absolutely open to ESL teachers, bilingual, dual language. You will all benefit from it, I promise. Okay. okay. All right, let me jump back in here right. because um, the responses are starting to come in, but there, there was a conversation happening in the chat about pass along papers. Okay. Um, I didn't read it. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. You were, uh, I was keeping an eye on it because okay. I wanted to bring it up, but it seems like the pass along papers piece is um, coming up quite a bit on the, okay. um, the exit tickets. There's a, there's a lot going on here. So I'll, I'll give you a, a couple seconds of quiet to peruse those. Yeah. Wall Street co-teacher, the pass along paper. I love that. I'll go back and read all of those. Definitely, we'll be able to send you that uh, chat so you can see everything that people are sharing. But it was interesting with the pass along papers. Um, somebody was saying, um, Anna Maria was saying, love the idea, but nowadays we can't do that because of spacing and probably touch points and that sort of thing. And so people were coming together and saying, maybe try a Padlet or maybe sh try a shared <laughs> Google Doc. Or, exactly. um, and I was keeping a close eye on that because I love it when uh, we all come together to, um, to help each other out, so. Absolutely, so I have an activity as well, the roving paragraph frames, which is similar to it, it's not the same, but it's similar. And 
I adapted that. And a lot of the sidelift trainers adapted that as well for the virtual space. And it's exactly what you said, Liz. It's a Google document and you put students into breakout rooms, you give them the stems and they're able to build on that for each other. And then you have them switch partners. So I think yes. that's the beautiful thing is everything is, is adaptable so much. And yeah. I love the what, uh, hold on, I just scroll back in the chat here. Um, somebody said, one thing I learned from this webinar is encouraging campus leadership team to create and provide opportunities for ESL and LOAT teachers to collaborate. Yes. yes that's our goal. Okay. Absolutely. That's our goal. Yes, whiteboard.fi. Absolutely. I've heard about that. I should have mentioned that. That's a very, very good one. All um, right. I'm going to steal screen control back from you. Do it. Really do it. Um, because we do have a couple questions that we need to get to. Uh, but first, I want to let everybody know what's coming up next week. Next week, we'll have a very brief webinar to close out our spring webinar series on our new uh, Saddleback Go ELL Literacy Library, which is a fantastic resource for tween English learners. I want to tell you all about it. Uh, we'll keep it short because we're kind of wrapping up the webinar season for the spring. Um, but if you're looking for resources for your upper elementary and middle school, uh, English learners and you need um, high interest, low readability, uh, come check it out for sure because I think you're really going to be uh, excited by what you see. So you'll get an email prompting you to register for that or you can register on our website. And don't forget, there's there's my picture again. <laughs> Don't forget we have Saddleback Digital now available. We have an on-demand webinar available on our YouTube channel for you to check out if you need more information on that. Okay, now let's get to these questions. Um, I still see a lot of chats coming in here. Okay, very good. And let's get to the questions here. So these, sort of, these questions sort of um, trickled in as you were speaking and I feel like you, um, you, uh, you, you did address them really through your content, but it's, it never hurts to, to go back and um, revisit, right? right? So this idea of native language use. So mm -hmm. Melba wants to know, should an ESL support teacher translate to Spanish for a student that is, um, has no English in, in biology? I think we're talking about a student with no English in a content area classroom. Um, should the support teacher be translating and this question came in before you got to the language native language support piece no way. Okay. but um, uh, just in case uh, let's let's go back and um, kind of talk about that for a second uh, briefly for for those who who might have missed it so is that okay for sure let's talk about it the funny thing is Liz, it almost looks like the person below answered the question so correct i want to yes. bring up her answer but if you happen to miss that piece since you said it came through. I talked about the 90-10, right? So 90% of the instruction is in the target language. The 10% is native language. That 10%, it's allowable for students to use resources, whether it's a dictionary, a translator, a peer, to help make some of their content more comprehensible to them. So from that aspect, yes, but it's not how you're phrasing it is translate to Spanish. I agree with the person that responded that it doesn't need to be a direct word for word translation because that's not going to do the student any service if they just had everything translated for them. Um, I wanna read her response. I coach my ESL support teachers and aides to clarify five words to one full sentence in the first language, but in tier one instruction, the target language English should be used with sheltered strategies. That's a phenomenal answer. Yes, our students are going to need that native language support. They might receive something, a piece of text, a vocabulary list, something like what Pam provided that mylanguages.org that can give student in their native language a gist of what the content is about. So they have that, that background knowledge that's activated. But ultimately, if the goal is target language instruction of English, you're going to want to use sheltered strategies to get students to, to help make the connection. But that native language is there to help facilitate that connection. I hope that answers the question. We never, um, never, ever, ever just want an ESL support person that's strictly translating, 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 because the student's not going to learn from that. Got it. Thank you. And this other question that came in from Ala, this is a very, uh, again, a common question when you mention things like uh, Nuzella or, or differentiation. And that is, well, I've heard that simplifying the language of an original text is not a good strategy because we're taking the richness of the language from the text. Mm -hmm. So for, from using that lens, 
how do we use something like Newzella or some of these resources that are out there that are differentiated? And I like this question because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it plays into that, again, the 90-10 thing. And what you said about the 90%, if it's not comprehensible, then it's not 90%. Isn't that what you said? Exactly what I said. Okay. Absolutely. So, let, let me uh, give you a second to kind of respond to that um, notion of um, simplified texts and their their place in uh, in in a language program or in a, in a classroom for language acquisition. For sure, they have a place. They absolutely have a place. And, and here's what we wanna talk about, Ala, is it's not completely removing the original text. It's using that as a scaffold. It's a scaffold for the language. And so what we do in our training, and I'll speak specifically to the foreign language training, but the English language learner trainings that we offer do a very similar thing with a strategy called embedded reading. We begin with a simplified version, just so students can understand the gist. At first goal, meaning making. Do we comprehend what the text is about? What is the topic? What do we want our students to know about the topic? And then we move on from there to a, a piece of text that's still it kind of in the middle of the two, okay? We're kind of elevating it. We're using slightly richer grammatical concepts and vocabulary, but still maintaining the fact that the student understands it. We have that 90% comprehension. Once we do a lot of work with an embedded text, we have students, uh, interacting with a peer, speaking about it, using it in a sentence, writing about it. We're sure that comprehension is there. We slowly scaffold up to the original. And by that time, that's what, again, we do that in our trainings all the time, that we take something, we break it out onto multiple slides, we simplify the language, we support it with visuals. And once our people are like, ah, okay, I got it, then bam, we show the original text. And it's actually really empowering because then they're able to further make those connections. I hope that that answers it to, to some extent. That's pretty much what I thought you were going to say. But yeah, I, and I love that that question even came in because it's such a common one. Mm -hmm. um, so, so thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And thank you to all of you who took the time to join us today. Um, we just, of course, love that you continue to visit with us every week and uh, have these conversations and, and further your professional learning. We're so honored that you do so. Um, this recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning and everybody who registered uh, will be getting a link to the recording. So everybody will be able to get this, this video. All right, thank you once again to Anna for, for joining us and putting together this great presentation today. And uh, here's where you can find Saddleback on social media, whatever your favorite platform is, we are there. So find us, don't be shy, say hello, connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you once again, everybody. Thank you, Anna, and we'll see you all again next week. Take care. Thank you so much.